diseases like DCM actually benefit the most from having diagnostic criteria. I think looking into the field of rheumatology really supports this because many of the conditions, the autoimmune conditions, do have variable presentations and almost all of them have valid and widely used diagnostic criteria that will support the clinician in making the diagnosis. Hello, welcome to Myelopathy Matters, the official podcast of the charity myelopathy.org. Where we talk all things degenerative cervical myelopathy from the perspective of the professionals, the researchers and the people living with myelopathy. I'm Ben Davies, neurosurgeon, scientist and the founder of myelopathy.org. I'm Ewan Sadler, a person with DCM and also a founder of myelopathy.org. This is Myelopathy Matters. So as we kick off 2023, we are hearing the latest from myelopathy.org's task forces, groups of different healthcare professionals and people living with DCM from around the world advancing key research priorities. Last month, we heard from Dr. Arya Nuri, looking to lay the foundations for research that can look at the onset of DCM. This month, we hear from Dr. Lindsay Tetro, who is working to establish the first diagnostic criteria for DCM. I know you and you've been helping to champion this project. Yes, as you know, it's up there with awareness. This is something else that is so close to my heart. Early diagnosis and treatment is key in DCM. And it's great that we have such a diverse group of health professionals working alongside people with DCM to really push this important research initiative. Well, let's hear how it's all going. Asking the questions is Liz Roberts, our RICO DCM project manager, and answering them, Dr. Lindsay Tetro, a neurology resident from New York and one of the most published researchers in the field of DCM. What is the Diagnostic Criteria Incubator? Broadly, who is involved? So as part of the AOSpine Recode DCM project, we generated a list of the top 10 priorities to try and stimulate further research and address some of the most critical knowledge gaps in the literature. And one of the priorities we identified was the need to develop diagnostic criteria for DCM. And we identify this as a priority in an attempt to shorten the time to diagnosis and improve the pathway of care to definitive management for these patients. So um, who's involved in the incubator? So there are a number of individuals who are participating in this incubator project. And these include primary care physicians, neuro and orthopedic spine surgeons, neurologists, physiatrists, and allied health uh, professionals. And the project has also recruited through myelopathy.org individuals with lived experience as well as their caregivers. And, you know, I have to say that it has been invaluable hearing their stories and seeing the challenges they face in order to obtain the correct diagnosis. What's your motivation for being part of the Diagnostic Criteria Incubator? What do you see as its role and opportunity? So unfortunately, as a you know, early neurology resident, I have seen a number of patients present to my clinic or even worse to the emergency department with moderate to severe myelopathy that has been misdiagnosed. And this is especially common in the neighborhood I work in, in Brooklyn, as my patients often are undocumented or uninsured and have less access to specialists. So as such, they have to rely on their primary care physician to identify the warning signs and symptoms of myelopathy. And a main problem here is that DCM is completely underrepresented in medical school or postgraduate curriculum, and many primary care doctors do not feel confident when performing a neurological examination. And this is a concept us neurologists actually refer to as neurophobia. So further emphasizing this issue, many studies have demonstrated that patients wait sometimes up to two years to be evaluated by a spine surgeon. And intuitively, this is detrimental to the recovery, and those who wait this long for a diagnosis are certainly more likely to be unable to work and are more likely to be dependent on others for their activities of daily living. So this really is my motivation. 
I want to develop diagnostic criteria to facilitate earlier diagnosis and treatment and try to empower primary care physicians to order neuroimaging themselves if they feel like the symptoms fit. So don't rely just on the specialists if you don't need to. Unfortunately, that's me suggesting skipping neurologists and really getting primary care physicians to make the diagnosis and refer to surgeons if they fit the diagnostic criteria. So can you tell us a bit more about how you're coming to resolve what these criteria should be, please? What are you currently working on? So the ultimate goal of this project is to develop diagnostic criteria that will combine common signs and symptoms of DCM and provide guidance, especially to the primary care physicians, on when to pursue further neuroimaging. This initiative does consist of a number of steps, and the reason why we've used this kind of multifaceted approach is that we want our final product to be relevant, reliable, valid, and used in several different clinical settings. So what we're doing is collecting and performing these systematic reviews of the literature to try and define the most sensitive, specific, and frequent signs and symptoms of DCM. And we're also collecting data from surveys of individuals with lived experience, as well as professionals in neurology, physiatry, spine surgery, and primary care. And then with this information, we're going to have a consensus meeting that includes some of the world's experts in DCM to try and figure out what the most relevant signs and symptoms are that should comprise this diagnostic criteria. So how do you think this work could help clinical care? The reality is DCM is a heterogeneous disease that is often misdiagnosed due to a combination of its subtle, nonspecific symptoms due to incomplete neurological assessments by clinicians and because there is a lack of public and unfortunately professional awareness of this condition. And failure to recognize the signs and symptoms of DCM does delay assessment by a spine surgeon, which could result in incomplete post-operative recovery, lifelong disability, and increased dependence in rates of unemployment. You know, even if a patient is not going to undergo surgery, they need to get in the hands of the right specialist, and that's really spine surgery. So diagnostic criteria would be invaluable in clinical practice and should help to identify high-risk patients and those who should be referred for further imaging and for further surgical evaluation. I do anticipate that these diagnostic criteria will improve patient care by allowing for earlier diagnosis, for enabling the development of an appropriate triage and surveillance system, and helping to standardize populations in future research studies. Okay, what has been achieved so far in this incubator? So far, we have been able to conduct two systematic and scoping reviews of the literature to summarize the most sensitive, specific, and frequent signs and symptoms of DCM. And in doing so, we have not only identified the most common symptoms of DCM, but have also identified a wide range of presentations and more subtle symptoms of this condition. We also have conducted a survey that asks patients what symptoms they currently experience from DCM and what their very first symptom was. And then we're also in the process now of formulating a survey that we will uh, distribute to clinicians from a wide range of specialties that encounter patients with DCM. And the purpose of this survey will be to ask these clinicians what they think are the most important signs and symptoms to include in diagnostic criteria for DCM. Were there any surprises when you started to examine the literature? So there are a number of challenges that we are facing in developing diagnostic criteria for DCM. And the reason for this is that DCM is a very heterogeneous disease and there is no single clinical feature or diagnostic test that is sufficient for its diagnosis. There are some patients who present 
with textbook symptoms of neck pain, bilateral hand paresthesias, and gait impairment, but many others will initially have very vague and subtle symptoms. The reviews that we conducted have identified that there are some signs and symptoms of DCM that may not trigger a clinician to even consider DCM on the differentials. Things such as dizziness, headaches, spasms, heaviness, etc. So that was quite interesting for me when I did the review is that now, while hand paresthesias and clumsiness and imbalance came up often, there are a number of signs and symptoms that I didn't even appreciate were consistent with DCM. So having said this, you know, heterogeneous diseases like DCM actually benefit the most from having diagnostic criteria. And I think looking into the field of rheumatology really supports this because Many of the conditions, the autoimmune conditions, do have variable presentations, and almost all of them have valid and widely used diagnostic criteria that will support the clinician in making the diagnosis. We've heard a few times now that um, rheumatologists will be one of the important groups of people to target. And I think there's, there's something else in this, isn't there? There's some lessons that we can learn from the rheumatology field, because as you say, they have to work with quite a disparate group of symptoms as well to diagnose the condition. So what can we learn from the rheumatology field? You know, rheumatologists deal with autoimmune conditions such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, And if you take a look at the diagnostic criteria for these conditions, you see that they combined clinical signs and symptoms, certain blood tests, as well as certain features on imaging. And the reason that they require these broader diagnostic criteria is because the presentations of these autoimmune conditions are very heterogeneous and there's not a one size fits all way to diagnose these conditions. You know, DCM is very similar. I believe diagnostic criteria will enable and facilitate earlier diagnosis for these patients, which to me is, is one of the most important things that we can do for these individuals. Couldn't you see in the future a sort of diagnostic algorithm which might take into account um, combinations of symptoms perhaps? That's exactly what I have in mind in terms of um, these diagnostic criteria. What I foresee is that they will consist of a combination of signs and symptoms, and each sign and symptom in the criteria will carry a different weight depending on its importance or relevance. And then patients who reach a certain number, a certain threshold, will qualify for probable DCM and we will encourage primary care physicians to then pursue neuroimaging, which is really what's needed to either confirm or refute the diagnosis. You mentioned blood tests earlier for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, are we getting anywhere with blood tests, uh, diagnostic blood tests for DCM? Not yet. Um, really, the, the only way to make the diagnosis is by history, physical exam, and performing an MRI of the cervical spine. But, you know, certainly some work is currently underway looking at other CSF or biomarkers of this condition. Okay, so how do you think we can get the messages of Recode out to the people doing the diagnosing, which um, I guess in most people's case would be their primary care physicians, um, maybe neurologists. Do you have any tips for targeting these people with our sort of educational initiatives? There are certain resources that primary care physicians use to gather their information. At least in the United States, all the primary care physicians, or at least the ones in training, will subscribe to the American Family Physician Society and will receive a monthly journal with different articles on common conditions. So one way would be to publish a review article that includes our diagnostic criteria in that journal. Another way is that a lot of people refer to -to up-to-date. And if you look at the degenerative cervical myelopathy up-to-date article, it's actually still referred to as cervical spondylotic myelopathy. And most of the literature published in that up-to-date article is published before 2010. And certainly a number of studies 
have been published that have changed the the scope or the nature of the field and the management of the condition, you know, including the publication of the 2017 AO Spine DCM guidelines. So we're doing uh, through myelopathy.org and the Recode Project video promotions, podcasts. These are all ways that trainees learn. So I guess it will be getting um, getting the correct and up to date information into the curricula for junior doctors and things like that as well. Exactly. I mean, when when I was in medical school, which wasn't that long ago, we had no lecture on degenerative cervical myelopathy. I didn't come across it at all in my textbooks. And upon studying for my board exam, such as a U.S. medical licensing exam, it came up in our question banks maybe one or two times. And so it's really underrepresented in our medical school curriculum and even in you know some of these commonly used question banks that students use to study. How can interested people get involved in this incubator then? So if you're interested, you can certainly get in touch with the people at myelopathy.org. We will certainly need some volunteers for the final part of the project, which will be to review case vignettes and determine the likelihood that the case is consistent with DCM. And then even after these criteria are developed, there will be lots of opportunities to help promote the work and to ensure that this work is translated into clinical practice. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Well, it's been really interesting speaking to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was a great interview, and it's great to have people like Lindsay on board with us. So, Ben, how do you think we are doing? Well, you're certainly in good hands with Lindsay. I remember when she was helping to put together the research priorities, this was a question that immediately caught her attention. And I think that speaks to her different perspectives. It's hard to put into words, but the mindset of healthcare professionals is really shaped by how they train and and the roles that they play. As surgeons, our role is to offer surgery. This makes us very focused on imaging, looking at the anatomical structures that we could change. Lindsay, on the other hand, is closer to the front line, diagnostics. She's trying to pick out DCM amongst a range of different problems. And often where imaging doesn't have a role or she needs to fulfill certain criteria to justify imaging. So when she saw this question, her mind immediately spotted a significant opportunity, one where there are well-defined methodologies from other areas of healthcare. And this has been one of the most powerful things about Recode, that bringing together lots of different perspectives. And I've also learned a new saying, neurophobia. That's definitely a new one for me, but I agree. <laughs> Do you have neurophobia, yeah? No, I don't think I have. <laughs> no, that diversity has been really, really important. Actually, it picks up on a, an editorial this month from the Global Spine Journal, one of the leading spine care journals, which was discussing lower back pain and how different professionals viewed its cause uh, and the implications it had on their care. So surgeons, for example, looked at structure and therefore offered injections, maybe some physiotherapy or surgery. The neurologists viewed it as a form of neuropathy and therefore they gave neuropathic analgesia, nerve painkillers, whilst the pain physicians also recognised the perception of pain and therefore advocated counselling. Now, ultimately, there is probably some truth in all of that, and how much will depend very much on the individual patient circumstances. However, that is a problem in modern healthcare, the way it's set up. You know, each problem is supposed to have one designated specialist. If you get the wrong perspective for your circumstances, you might not get the best outcome for you. I'm rambling a little bit now, but my point is, I think Rico DCM is a fairly unique opportunity because it's looking at the whole disease. You use a diversity of perspective to spot and prioritise the many different challenges, but also spot and deliver solutions. The formation of diagnostic criteria is a prime example of this. So Ben, how long does this project have left to go? Well, as with any project delivered by volunteers, things are up and down. But my understanding is Lindsay hopes to have criteria, or certainly provisional criteria, by the end of this year. So Ben, what's up for next month? Next month, we hear again from Professor Chad Cook on the goals and the progress from the perioperative rehabilitation incubator, a group working to define exactly what care other than surgery should look like. Thanks very much to Lindsay Tetro for joining us. This was Myelopathy Matters from myelopathy.org. The podcast is always produced by Carl Homer from Cambridge TV. To keep up to date with the latest in the field, why not subscribe on your favourite podcast app, where you'll also find all of our previous episodes. There's lots more information and support to be found on our website, myelopathy.org. But if you've got a question about myelopathy or an experience to share, we'd love to hear it. Please get in touch at ben at myelopathy.org. But until next time, goodbye.